it's such a privilege to have you here. And I, I just want to provide some context to the audience so they can understand where you're coming from. So in the SEC, there's 14 institutions. And let's say on average, there's 15 coaches at each institution. That gives you essentially uh, over 200 coaches that you get to observe in high pressure situations on a yearly basis. Talk about some of the qualities that you notice of high performing coaches. I, I didn't know the number and I was asked a couple of weeks ago, there's been 20 national championships in, in the last four years. Some of the more interesting moments are when we've had two SEC teams playing late into the postseason. And then to watch almost what you saw with the Florida State UCLA softball game, the falling short, just short for whatever reason. And then to move beyond quickly and focus on the next opportunity. Dave Van Horn in baseball last year, you know, his team was back in the College World Series this year after dropping a ninth inning, third out fall. And so that type of resilience is a characteristic that, that's central to success because at a high level, or really at any level, it, it, your, your life's not going to simply be filled with success. And what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see coaches make? Tim Corbin had a great quote that will be in a staff meeting I lead tomorrow. It'll be actually an opening slide, that this team was great about doing the small things well. And that may not be the exact quote, but the last five or six words are. And one of my lessons early on, when I was commissioner of the Southland Conference, which has schools in Texas and Louisiana, Louisiana at the time as Division I, but a smaller level, is I encountered some folks who obsessed over minutia that really didn't matter. And so I think in, in the coaching profession, you're in this struggle between, as a head coach, I have to worry about everything in my program, but then you have to figure out where to spend your energy and your, your mental focus. And that's where I think one of the mistakes for people that aren't successful is they're not focusing on the right, right issues, right things. That's one. Two is what works in context A will not work in context B. So that's just contextual. And then what works in context A for coach A would not work for coach A in context B, which is another level of context to say the really good people can ad adapt and adjust to their environments. And you know, I've watched, we have any number of, of guys that coach for, for Nick Saban and Alabama's assistants. The guys who are really, really effective, I think understand they're not Nick and they're not at the University of Alabama. And you take Kirby, for example, at Georgia Kirby Smart. So Kirby was a student athlete there, but he has to function in the context of the University of Georgia, which is different than uh, being the head football coach at Alabama. And uh, you know, at some point, whether you're successful or not successful, the ability to attract talent is key. And there are some things you, you, you think about and you wonder about, which is coaching staff continuity. I think you can win. I think Alabama and Nick have shown you can win with a lot of staff turnover. Uh, but you have to constantly fill those positions with the right people. And I have watched coaches, in my view, fail, not because they weren't great head coaches, but because they weren't great at evaluating the, the talent closest to them, which is not quarterbacks or centers or, or uh, shortstops. It's their staff and the people uh, around them. And to piggyback off of that point, when we ask athletes the top three things that get in the way of their team maximizing their ability, over 90% of them go to the human side. Does that surprise you? You know, tactics are tactics. And Buzz Williams is playing Duke in, what, the Elite Eight? And Buzz is now in our league. And he was telling a story where that last out-of-bounds play, he has nothing to do with it. It's assigned to someone he trusts who is in the X and O business. I think Buzz is in the X and O business, but he's also in the people business and is very open about that. Um, the, the ability to have those relationships that are probably highlighted by those post-its on the human side is transcendent through a program that's successful. What I, what I mean by that is you're going to have different relationships. People are going to be treated in a different way. They may be evaluated in a different way, but there's going to be a fundamental relationship that is based on trust. And the issues that come across your desk what percent of them are human related as opposed to anything technical? Probably 90% in, in 
then the result of that is that I was asked the question in a different way about three months ago by one of my senior leadership team, which is how much of what you spend your day on is black and white and how much of it is gray. And that's where the 90% number comes from. And so I'm answering that when you're dealing with humanity, you're dealing less in absolutes, more in relationships, and more in a set of variables in those relationships that you may not comprehend initially and are going to have to learn over time. Thus, I, I liken it to that. It's not as black and white as you think. Well, and you shared with me a story that you learned in college that you carried on to this day about leadership. I played uh, college baseball and junior college basketball, and it, it was an unremarkable talent, which informs my uh, observation of an athlete's understanding of their talent versus <laughs> the rest of the world's observation of their talent. Um, so at 18 and 19 years old, you know, you have these perspectives that aren't really well informed. And so I was a backup catcher on an NAIA baseball team and loved the experience and got in a few games. The first time I ever played in a game, actually the first hit was the first game I started. It was a double. It was, I was a, I'm right-handed. It was a left-handed pitcher who threw me a curveball. And those of you who understand baseball, I fought it off about that far inside the right field line. I mean, it was not a technically good application of the mechanics of baseball swing to a curveball thrown by a left-handed pitcher. And I'm at second base, slid in head first. And uh, fast forward, we play that same team a couple weeks later in a double header. So it's now the same situation. Well, I know I'm going to play in the second game. You know, it happened before I played well. And we play the first game. Coach doesn't look at me between games. Uh, I don't get in. And so there's a point at which during that game I shut down. That's a bit of my adult knowledge to how I react to frustrating moments. And so I had been kind of a, an energizing person, a, a, not a cheerleader, but somebody who has enthusiasm. Um, uh, you could question my ethics, but I was pretty good at stealing signs, just watching and figuring out what the indicators were and what was going on. And uh, that day I stopped. And I remember vividly my attitude was, well, if I'm gonna have a bone bruise on my hand from catching more pitch baseballs than the starting catcher. And I have lace marks up my arm because our pitching staff wasn't great. So it bounced in the dirt. And I don't get a chance to play against a team I've proven I can do it against. Then why should I? And you can fill in the blank. And so that was a Saturday. <clears throat> Sunday, the next day, there's a knock on my, my dorm room door. And I open the door, and it's my baseball coach, Roger Kiefer. And I'm like, oh, hey, coach. <laughs> like, he's not supposed to be there on a Sunday night. And he said, Sank, can we talk? And I said, sure, you want to come in the room? And he says, no, let's go. And there was a lounge. And I remember vividly sitting at the lounge. My back was against the wall. He was looking at me, and he said, if we'd have lost that game yesterday, I would have considered it your fault. And again, I'm 18, 19 years old. I'm like, wait a second, I didn't play. And I said, like, what, what do you mean? And he said, you have no idea how important you are to this team. When you stopped, you affected the entire team and our ability to succeed. And it was this bigger picture of an individual's impact on a team, some of which you've seen play out through the day. One, it's probably the first time anybody said, you have a chance to lead or be a leader, not because of your necessarily talent, not because of your position. I, I didn't have a captain's label and didn't deserve one. I wasn't even close. Uh, but that I had a role from a leadership position that was important to a group of people. And I think part of the reason I do what I do today um, and jumped off uh, studying engineering to go into education and wanting to coach was because that was a coach who became a human being and filled the post-it notes up to the human side and I didn't really matter on that team. And the very first day I was commissioner of the Southeastern Conference, I got nothing done. So our conference is officially a day behind because I made no productive contributions because I spent the day writing emails and letters. And he was one to people who at very specific points in my life had made a difference. And that leadership story um, has never left. And it, it, it informs the relational nature, the educational nature of athletics and and I think 
there are few ways that you can learn that lesson. Not that there are no ways, but few ways you can learn that as directly as I did that weekend way back in 1983. Well, someone else that's a great coach that has an impact on many is Tim Corbin, and you just went out and watched him win another national championship. Before you play the clip, I rarely see him without a cap. <laughs> so, you know, like baseball guys, when you see them, their full head of hair, you're like, oh, that's what he looks He has like. hair. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, after the game, um, you sent out this tweet, yeah. and this is what was happening. Why did you send that out? You know, there's, there's a lot to Vanderbilt having won that national championship, from my experience with that program. One is um, there's seven seniors that won that national championship who the first weekend of the NCAA tournament in 2016 had a teammate ground and again you think about 18 and 19 year olds being faced with the reality of a death of a teammate as they walk into the NCAA tournament they had been to the college world series the two previous years they'd won in 14 and, and lost in three games to Virginia in 15 and so really really high expectations so that's one two they lost their athletic director who retired and 10 days later passed away who who went through this journey with Tim and then you just see someone who just was a part of a national championship winning team. He was not told to do that because I asked, like, was that his job that day? I said, no, that's who he is. And that's about character. That's a revelation of a real person that's beyond the celebration on that field. So the moment I saw that, there were a set of emotions around having seen Donnie Everett's mom and dad. And one of the things I did, that's a very small storyline in the SEC. So. Missouri's SEC country, for those of you that are around here. Um, and we have perceptions. You probably have perceptions. But the next year, when we came to our baseball tournament, when Tim eulogized Donnie, he told a story about in high school, he had thrown 100 miles an hour or more, been timed at that, had been in Baseball America. Never did it in college. He got injured a little bit in his freshman spring, didn't pitch as much. And so he's charting plays, he's teammates, you know, they can get on you. Hey, you, you're the century mark guy. And his last pitch before he passed away was in the Southeastern Conference Tournament. He threw 101 miles an hour that shows up on the scoreboard. And so as we went to the tournament the next year, I said to our staff member in charge of baseball, I said, I want you to find a way to put the number 101 <clears throat> up on the scoreboard. And we're not going to advertise it. It's just a way for us to, to honor uh, Donnie. So, the, the, you know, I don't cheer for teams. I was happy for them. But I think that was a representation of having watched a whole set of young people have to go through some things and go through some learning to then achieve the ultimate goal that, you know, on Monday night, the, the Michigan pitcher just shut them down. So completely in doubt. And, you know, I was hopeful. And I just thought that was a great moment. Uh, that it's a little bit more, even for us in, in the SEC, than, than just winning and losing. Well, and I think it speaks to what Tim does with his classroom, that he truly does approach it like that. And one of the cool things about what he did is this was an example after a game, and this is how Tim teaches his team this is what it should look like. So he's closing the gap of interpretation. So is it any wonder that that guy took it upon himself to do something like that? And, and that's a culture. Um, and I didn't take notes on everything because I was working on a staff meeting. Um, and, you know, one of my challenges is culture. And I was sharing with Mike Holder in a way he probably didn't understand. But I've watched in my 16 years in the SEC, we, we had Vince Dooley. Uh, we had Doug Dickey. Uh, we had Skip Burton. We had these guys who were legends in coaching and won national championships, much like Mike. And we've had a lot of change in four years at the athletics director level and the president and chancellor level. So I'm constantly thinking about culture. And I, I can't get my presidents and chancellors to clean up the meeting rooms after we leave. <laughs> so that's a little bit on our staff. But how do I create a culture for our staff that's a little bit representative of, of that? Uh, those small things make a big difference. But then in a bigger meeting room as we're making decisions, what has guided us 10 years ago and 20 years ago to make really wise decisions that can guide us for the next 10 or 20 years. That's 
That is a culture, and, and that's what's represented in that photo. And I'll tell you, I have other photos from my year that are like the opponent's dugout on the left, not the ones on the right. So I will say when I retweeted that, I know that I have a bunch of coaches in my league who follow me, and they needed to see a clean <laughs> dugout or a clean locker room. Well, there you go. Passive aggressive. <laughs> there you go. So... Maybe shifting to priority alignment a little bit, um, Rob Mullins, a colleague of yours, um, sent this to me, and it had a big impact on me, and it's a Neil Armstrong quote. It said, if you're an inch off on landing, no big deal. If you're an inch off on takeoff, you miss the moon by a million miles. You took off to the SEC commissioner, but before takeoff, if we go back to 31 years old, you learned a lesson from the bathroom floor. Yeah. So here's a principle. I, I, I've watched from up above. Many of you are taking notes. So this will be the most important lesson of your entire day, trust me. So get the pens out. If you ever wake up on a bathroom floor, you're not in a good place in life. <laughs> so I was traveling to a meeting with Roy Kramer, the commissioner of the SEC. It would have been my first meeting, interestingly enough, in the SEC commissioner's office. I was commissioner of the Southland Conference. I just finished my first year. I flew from Dallas to Atlanta. I was driving from Atlanta to Birmingham, which is about two and a half hours. I left the airplane. I went to the men's restroom. I was standing there staring at the wall doing what you do in the men's restroom, and I got lightheaded. And the next thing I know, someone's saying, it's okay, sir. We've called for help. Just stay down on the floor. And I'm like, wow, I wonder who they're talking to. Literally, I can remember processing that. And I realized there's tile right by my face. Um, and, and there's actually a lesson in there. So I tell college students and our student athletes that. And they're usually on the floor for different reasons at that age. But um, there are some adults who struggle with that. And so uh, I had an irregular heartbeat. I hadn't slept well. I hadn't eaten right. I hadn't been exercising. And, and I'm the commissioner of the Southland Conference. Um, it's not like they're writing in the New York Times about me. It's that inner drive to be incredibly successful. And the Delta Airlines red coat who helped finally got a hold of my wife. She didn't have a cell phone at that time. This was in 96, 97. And she was at gymnastics with our daughters. And he walks in and hands me the phone and says, it's your wife. And my wife says, what are you trying to do to me? And she's a very kind person because what he had said to her, uh, is Mrs. Sankey, this is Mike from Delta Airlines. Have you heard about your husband? So if you work in the airlines, that's not the right way to start that conversation. <laughs> and I had an atrial fibrillation. You know, eventually it took a while to get it clicked back on that night, spent a night in the hospital. And then I spent six months visiting with pe people about how do you balance being uh, in charge in, at home? How do you find balance in life? And I went through this endeavor. I took notes. I bought lunches. Um, and then I walked through a bookstore and I saw a book called The Life You've Always Wanted by a guy named John Ortberg. And, and John is uh, the pastor at Menlo Park Presbyterian Church in California. I've met him once. It was a prayer line. And you're supposed to get in line like at the Presbyterian Church to ask for prayer. And I said, hey, I don't have any prayer requests. I just want you to know you really impacted my life. <laughs> and about the 12th chapter in, there's a line that says, seeking balance in life is an insufficient goal. It's not that it's too challenging, it's it's too slight. Well, I just had all these notes. And so I, I realized I, had, I needed a set of principles that would drive my priorities. And so I, I actually have with me in a, in a wallet, a laminated card and my poor typing skills that I wrote in 2002, set of principles, you know, it's not about me, laugh every day, um, aid others that, informed my life and have so far kept me off the bathroom floor again. Uh, but it's disturbing that it takes that kind of event in my own life to open my eyes that, you know, four hours of sleep and uh, four lattes every day to keep me going is going to eventually result in a problem. And it's so easy to get off track as a coach. I'd like to share with you uh, something that Mary Wise, coach in your conference, she wrote a letter to her younger self. I'm going to play it. I'd just like your thoughts on it. Dear young Mary, I know that you're judged by that win-loss column. You're hired and fired by it. But you must believe there's something more important than that. And that belief must be part of your core. 
Because when it is, you'll have perspective to help you get over the losses. It doesn't mean losing becomes easy. It never does. But you can have some perspective. That's the one thing I wish I could give you, perspective. And I encourage you to seek it earlier. It will help you direct your energy to what's important. And your players will appreciate that. They'll appreciate seeing that there are more important things to you than just winning. If they feel winning is the most important thing, they'll start to internalize they are only important to a coach if they are successful. And you don't want them to feel that way. Take it from me. I know what that feels like to have your importance be attached to your achievement. And you don't want to feel that way for the next 20 years. Seek perspective. Love, Mary Wise. Thoughts? You should take the last two words about seek perspective and sell those t-shirts in the lobby afterwards. Because the reality of competitive sports is that it becomes quickly a, a zero-sum game. So un unbeknownst to people, I coached college golf for a while, not nearly as well as Mike did. And you realize, like, I never won. I never won a tournament. Um, and the goal was to take a 10th place team and just not finish 10th, which you should never state as a negative, I've learned. But our goal was don't finish 10th. And we finished ninth, so um, we eventually got to fifth. But it was about perspective. Now, administrators have to have perspective. Um, fans, parents have to have perspectives, and, uh, perspective. And, and that's, that is incredibly difficult. So that's point one. Point two is I read the book over the weekend. So I, I read that, and I just thought about Mary, and if you understand what she's done, where she's done it, as long as she's done it, she's had a remarkable career. She doesn't have a national championship trophy. Um, and I was there in 17 when she was in the finals in Kansas City, just hoping, and it didn't happen. But it strikes me that Mary's the same before that as she is after that. Among those 200 plus coaches in our league, they don't all have that perspective, and it's so easy to lose perspective. The, the video of Jim on the sideline, was he wrong? Well, he's doing what's right, but there's a perspective that slipped in that moment for whatever reason. And we all are subject to that. And that's where I go back to the lesson from the bathroom floor is what's going to define you? That's what Mary is really saying to her younger self is you better figure out what is it going to define you. And uh, when I was in the interview process for the SEC commissioner, I'm in a car, 20 minute ride. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I was the number one ranked candidate. There were a lot of people saying it was mine. Uh, the decisions never makers, the decision makers never said that to me. So I'm in a car. I'm going to find out if my life's going to change one way or another. And as I got out of that car, as I exited to go into a meeting, I'm like, you know what? You did the best you could. And you can walk in and hold your head high knowing that you interviewed for one of the great jobs in all of college sports and were one of two. And you did your best. And, and, and I would probably tell myself that more intentionally. But I know that there's also a fuel to that that gets out of perspective pretty quickly. That's why I think that seek perspective line is probably the most important. Well, and it starts at a young age. I'd like to show a clip um, of how people are socialized. Ripped into left center field and deep. Oh, we are tied. Oh, my goodness. Jam A repeat of Ty Pete's swing, but gets it up in the air a little more. And listen to this crowd go <laughs> oh, crazy. Look at that. Get down there, Dad. Yeah. And he was charging down there. <laughs> That's fun. There you go. Here's another look. Whew. Dad. <laughs> Don't pass out, Dad. Stay with yeah, us. Yeah, you're all right. Well intentioned. What do you see when you see that?
when I, when I started in the SEC, the most aggressive phone calls I had were from parents. So the greatest lie among high school coaches, you know what it is? If I can coach at college, I'll never have to deal with parents again. You know what the greatest lie among college coaches is? If so, I can get to the NFL or the NBA, I'll never have to deal with parents again. And if you ever talk to people, NFL head coaches, I've had conversations about parents reaching out to them or they're called agents at that level. <laughs> so be careful what you wish for. Um, and whatever problems you have, they may have different titles. Um, so he's one of those parents, I'm sure he's a, f a fine person, who um, was calling me, not him personally, but I would get calls from club sport parents. So volleyball, soccer is where it started most frequently. And they were incredibly aggressive. And I'm like, wait a second, well, why are they calling a conference office about playing time, about communication on playing time, about playing time? <laughs> and I realized that those are parents who had spent so much time and money in that club system that their values were very, very different than sports where you came through a different um, oversight process because they ran the sports club. That's what I came to learn because I started asking him like, have you called people before? Yeah, I used to call my daughter's sports coach, you know, club coach all the time. And they always listened. Why aren't you listening? <laughs> um, and, and that's the threat. You know, I, I have a physical education degree and I learned the words pedia and ludus, which I think are Greek words about recreational play versus structured competition. And there's actually a Cornell study that goes back to the late 60s about how parents can mess up the game for the kids. And the adults can mess up the game for the young adults at the college level. And we ought to honor the competition and celebrate, but celebrate in context and not in a way that elevates that, that, that pressure and loses perspective. I'd like to run it back because there is something to be celebrated for this. And, and before I do, one of the great questions I love asking uh, athletes is, when are your parents, or when were they, most proud of you? Because it kind of informs their value system that they were shaped on. And as this hitter rounds first after hitting the home run, take a look at the second baseman on the other team. Yeah. Little League does a pretty good job of talking about that. You know, it's our broadcast partners who show the dad sprinting and pulling a hamstring. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, I, I don't mean to overjudge that circumstance, but when I was in the Southland Conference, I had different roles. I never heard from a parent, ever. When I came to the SEC level where you think, wow, you're distant from that, all of a sudden the phone would ring, and I was in the regulatory compliance area with these conversations, like, what is going on? And I think what's happening around competitive sport, and, and everybody in this room is dealing with it, is it's changing more rapidly than we've ever taken a step to understand. So we shifted from scholastic to club events. We've shifted from people who are coaching and overseeing that have school boards and principals to those who are running business entities. Um, and so the stakes have been elevated in a very different way early on. They're not all bad. It's just different. And then that plays out in a value structure. The fact that there's a moment there when number two says congratulations, uh, that ought to be the rule. And I'm going to give you a great exception. We had a hurdle competition. Grant Holloway uh, won the national championship. His leading competitors at the University of Kentucky, nicknamed D-Rob. D-Rob won the SEC championship in Fayetteville over Grant. Two guys found each other, hugged it out, talked about before they compete their text communication. It was the most direct rivalry that existed in the SEC this year between two people, always celebrating together, win or lose. And so Grant beats them at the national championship in Austin, sets collegiate record that had stood for over 30 years that were in all those skeets Nehemiah set, and, and D-Rob tied the record. Those are two guys who made each other better through competition, never once took away because you won. It wasn't a zero-sum game. It was together we're elevated. And I've told our staff, I don't know if our athletics directors will agree from an award standpoint, I think that's the best example of sportsmanship we have in the SEC this year. 
because they made each other better and never once made it made it about bitterness. That's powerful. And when you come up through a, a system that has that value structure, um, it doesn't leave. And so I want to just show you something that Gino Ariema said last year at the conference, and I'd just like to get your thoughts on it. Well, to me, it seems like you're taking cues from a different country. Yeah. And you're learning how to fit in. Yeah. And you realize if I achieve my ass off, yep. people will respect me. Correct. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thoughts? Um, there's a head coach who is in some of your videos who I had a personal moment with. When he, when he was talking about what, what motivates you. It's almost like what drives winning. And he said, fear. And I was with Mike Slive, the SEC commissioner before me, and we left there and said, wow, that was a moment. And Mike said, what drives you? He asked me. And I said, I'm afraid to fail. I said, what drives you? He said, oh, I'm the same way. And I've actually thought about that a great deal. And, and so what I think Gino's got the luxury of a lot of wins, a lot of championships. It's trying to figure out what is it that fuels a fire. And so when he says, yeah, people will recognize you and be happy with you, if you will, when you win. Yeah. Now, what's the alternative and what's the layer you have to pull off? I don't think fear of failure should be my motivation because that starts from a negative emotion but i'd be lying if i told you it wasn't there and so for me it goes back i think if i unpack it psychologically to a moment probably in junior high high school where shifted to a different school i want to make sure everybody knows i'm okay if i really unpacked it and um what you have to do is strip away pride and get to, you know, there's, there's a basis for the way you've been raised. There's a basis for the people around you. That moment with my baseball coach where um, people breathed into me to say, you actually can make a contribution. Now go make it in the right kind of way. So that's more of a driving force for me. Um, the reality is if you follow my social media feed, nobody's gonna give me a lot of commendation on Saturdays each fall. Uh, so I have to draw that satisfaction someplace else. And it's, it's so hard to learn that lesson. I'd like to show you another coach in your league. Um, and just, he's gonna talk about uh, the evening. Um, he played earlier that afternoon and lost, went to his son's sectional game, and then this happened. My son, he's a sophomore. He's at Bloomington North High School. He's going to Bloomington South. Okay, it's a sectional game. And my son checks in, second quarter. And all of a sudden, the student section at Bloomington South starts a Tom Crean sucks chant. And I'm sitting there with my daughter, and I'm sitting there with my wife. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so my kids call it the new normal when they look and all of a sudden, dad's this or dad's that. And when I was hired, um, I sat on an infractions case where my, near where my parents live for university. And so that was noted in the local newspaper article. And then my mom and dad are reading the comments that followed. I'm like, you can't read the comments anymore. <laughs> um, and you just, you have to separate that. So you asked me about the coaches who are successful. They are able to just put up a wall. And, and I don't think they're immune to it. I think that's a bit of a lie. So none of us are immune to criticism. It is what is going to consume your interest and in energy. And, um, you know, at this level, those moments will be frequent. I'm walking through a hotel lobby and a guy grabs me by the arm at our basketball tournament. And he says, I'm an LSU fan. I'm like, oh, here we go. Because the coach was suspended. And he said, I just want you to know there's a lot of us that are committed to doing things the right way and appreciate your, the job you're doing. But, but the reality is whether you're Tom, you're me, you're an athletics director at this level, you're just in a position of visibility that is very different, again, as this competitive sport thing, 
thing has evolved and you're subject to very public criticism, very public moments. You know, I watched Gary Bettman give uh, the Stanley Cup to the Pittsburgh uh, Penguins in Nashville and everybody booed. And my wife's like, why are they booing him? I said, I don't know, but I don't think it's funny anymore when they boo commissioners. <laughs> That's kind of a tradition in the NHL. Um, and so you have to adjust to that, that different reality, which, you know, I don't know what Tom did next. I'm waiting for the next part of the video. Well, I, I'm going to show you another video of another coach, though. And, and is this what you're speaking to? This is from Billy Donovan. I've always said this. When you're in a situation where you're highly, highly successful, you have to be in charge of your own happiness. First staff meeting, I told my entire staff, I said, I'm not in charge of your happiness. You are. You know, I want you to find joy in your work, but whether you're happy or not is actually your responsibility and your responsibility and decision. And if you're going to coach or, or you're going to be a conference commissioner and you're going to have those moments of, of wins and losses, uh, you're not going to win every game. One of the great basketball coaching clinic lessons for me when I was going to be a high school basketball coach was they like said, well, what are you going to do? You're going to deny the ball and bounce like you'll never deny the ball and bounce all the time to everyone. It just doesn't work that way. Right. And it's like you're never going to avoid losses. You're never going to avoid disappointment. So what's your center and how do you find the joy and the value in the learning process? And I'll, I'll add to that. I, I watched Dave Van Horn last year lose that College World Series. I'd never met his wife or his kids. and I've known Dave for 20 years. I walked out and the conversation I had with Dave's wife and his two daughters was like the most normal human interaction after this great disappointment. And that taught me something about that family that just like Billy, they found, they found happiness. Now Dave wants to win, absolutely wants to win. But in those moments, you better find that happiness someplace, otherwise it'll eat you alive. Well, and I just wanna go back to this slide and this is where we're gonna to end today is there was a great book um, that the Harvard Business Review put out. And there was an article that a professor had written, and it's something that he teaches all of his uh, students. The first question was that, how can I be sure that I'll be happy in my career? Second question, how can I be sure that my relationships with my spouse and my family become an enduring source of happiness? And then the third question was, how can I be sure that I'll stay out of jail? Right. And people look at that um, and think it's lighthearted, but he's watched many of his students that have come through that system end up in jail because of ethical issues. Yeah, and it's about the, the value system. So the, the secret is we had a phone conversation, and you told me to read that article, which I have, and then I've bought the licenses to share with my staff. And I would tell you, you should go find the article and read that article and find the entire context because it's about more than just this little happiness thing that shows up on the screen. It's about decision making at a corporate level in life. If you're if you lead a church, I mean, it's really a fascinating summary of how to develop a life view. When I looked at those questions, I went right to the one in the middle. Because if I've got the right relationships with the people closest to me, it's going to reflect on the happiness in my career, and it's going to help keep me out of jail if they're truth tellers. And, and I will go back up to the first one. So when I was going through career decisions, and this reflects on something Mike said earlier, like, how do I make a decision about my career? I want to take an opportunity where I'm going to be challenged, so that I can learn and grow. And when I reach the end of that cycle, like the day you see that I've resigned will be the day when you can say, I heard the guy speak and he stopped being challenged, learning and growing. I mean, literally. And then I've taken jobs where I lost money in the next job. So I was a commissioner of a division one conference. I'm in my mid thirties. Those are like retirement jobs. I made pretty good money. I went to the SEC, so everybody thinks, oh, he doubled his salary to go to the Southeastern Conference. I lost 35% of my money because I never asked up front, what are you going to pay me? What I asked was, what am I going to do? How am I going to work with you? And what might my responsibilities and my decision-making authority be? I also forgot to ask if I had to wear a tie every day. 
and that was the biggest miss. <laughs> that value system is how I've been happy in my career. By comparison, I've watched people, some of them who, who I work with still, who don't have that metric in place. It's just like, wow, I work for the biggest, baddest thing around. I'd never leave. And I've said to them, but you're not happy in this role. And I can't make you happy. Your happiness, remember, I told you, is your responsibility. So what are you going to do? Are you going to be passive or active in that decision making? And I think the deterioration, when those questions become problems in life, is because people are afraid to act. Powerful. Let's get off of Greg. <laughs>